Aw, yeah, it's that spooky dookie time of year, folks. The time when I'm at my greatest power. So let's kick things off a little early with a creepy tale from master of horror Stephen King's show that he didn't have anything to do with. Let's look at The Dead Zone. The Dead Zone is the tale of Johnny Smith, a school teacher who gets into a car accident and wakes up six years later with the power to see visions. This was adapted into a movie in 1983 starring Christopher Walken, and in 2002 it was made into a TV series starring Anthony Michael Hall. I love the movie. Christopher Walken is stellar and tragic, and the atmosphere is suitably creepy and sad. The TV series takes a slightly different tack, focusing less on the darker elements and more on Johnny's abilities. He's more of a superhero than a tragic figure. And that's fine by me, because they found a lot of really cool and interesting ways to approach the topic, often bending the rules just slightly or utilizing his visions in different ways. For instance, he can communicate with other psychics in the past or the future by using objects they touch as sort of time-traveling walkie-talkies. It kept things fresh, and for the first few seasons or so at least, it was a pretty damn engrossing show. But like any episodic series with several slots to fill a season, sometimes you get some really silly clunkers. So in season two, we were treated to misbegotten, what I think is their funniest So Bad It's Good episode. As you'll see by the end of this, it's a pretty apt title. It's got all the hallmarks of terrible early 2000s television. The dated pop culture references, a complete misunderstanding of technology, and twists and turns that are mm -mm bad. The Dead Zone's generally not a horror show, so this episode is just a detour into Creepsville. It begins in a pants wedding way that I think sadly a lot of YouTubers can relate to when Johnny encounters an obsessed fan in his house. She's played by Tracy Gold, and she was in Growing Pains. A YouTuber's second greatest fear is a long string of comments reminding you that you forgot to mention something. Anywho, Johnny's involvement in some high-profile cases has made him somewhat of a celebrity, so this is a bit old hat for him at this point. And even though it's kind of weird that he's good buddies with the man who married his fiance while he was in a coma and raised his son as his own, it does come in handy that he has the sheriff on speed dial. What, Walt couldn't come himself? Pfft. Well, screw me, I guess. Take her away, whoever you are. Hey, quick tip, Johnny. If people are prone to putting all of your business into tabloids, perhaps don't loudly discuss the affair you had with the sheriff's wife in front of the dozens of people working on your security system. All right, you gotta get beyond that. That was a one-night mistake. That changed everything. Oh, man, time to call my good buddy Walt about this. Well, that was scary. Anyway, time to drive around alone in the middle of nowhere. Are you hurt? Johnny was on his way to see his on-again, off-again girlfriend, depending on the episode, reporter Dana Bright. Let's just assume there's only, like, one road he could possibly take to meet her for lunch. How did the kidnappers know he was going to meet her and at that particular time? How long were they waiting there? This is just the start of Johnny's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. He's been taken to an eerie abandoned house by three women. Obsessed fan Penny, crappy hacker stereotype slash aspiring filmmaker Maddie, and technical consultant slash serial killer enthusiast Anita. Only real hacksaws use three monitors while listening to generic stock tracks. There's something oddly hilarious, imagining her setting up all of her tech geek stuff and proceeding to edit by generator. Not a very good use of your limited power here. Oliver Stone is a pussy. All right, don't flatter yourself. All we've seen is you add some jump cuts to a single shot of you guys stuffing a dude into a trunk. Hmm, I love being evil and gay. If everything rocks this hard, we're in business. That movie business, baby. How do you do, fellow kids? The ladies have a plan. A very stupid, ill-thought-out plan. See, they brought Johnny here because they're filming a little documentary about a series of murders that took place 20 years ago. That's nice. With Johnny's help, they plan to uncover the mystery of what really happened. Then, profit. You know, like Oliver Stone's The Blair Witch Project. Like The Blair Witch Project. But according to Maddie, this is way cooler. Because what they're doing, they're doing for real. What we're doing is real. Johnny, if you will give me the details, I'm gonna dramatize the visions with actors later on. Real. 
But pretty quickly, Johnny's visions kick in, and he realizes there's going to be more murders in this house before the night is over. The women believe he's just trying to scare them into setting him free, so now he has to convince them of the danger they're in before Sickle starts swinging. But first, hot Toll House cookies, everyone! Hot Toll House cookies, everyone! Why, hot Toll House cookies haven't been seen here in 20 years! Those Toll House cookies really filled me up. Was Toll House a sponsor, or...? Now this house has a story to tell, and you are here to tell it. And the sooner you do that, the sooner you get out of here. I need to touch things. I can't do it taped to this chair. Use your feet. Whoa, looks like really compelling footage, guys. Whether he wants to or not, Johnny's gonna dig deep into this house's past. Get a load of this rich bit of history. I thought I'd buy a roast. I can pick one up on the way back from town. If you want, I'll bake a pie. There were nice peaches yesterday. Now let me stare at the floor as we get dressed completely naturally like human beings. Daniel and Cheryl Connor. Hmm, couldn't have happened to a more boring couple. Anyway, to make a long story short, they never got that pie. They and their daughter were brutally killed that night by a drifter called the Reaper. The only survivor was their son Nicholas, who hid out in the basement for three days and came out of it understandably disturbed. He spent the time since then in and out of mental institutions and has since disappeared. According to Anita, murder historian, she's tried for two years to find him and come up with nothing. The audience checks their watches and wonders when the really obvious twist will happen. Oh no, who could this be? I did truly enjoy the Dead Zone guys, but they sure did master the art of the atmosphere-destroying scene dissolve. Big house, little house, big house barn, big house, little house So everyone is in full-out search mode for Johnny at this point, and Dana and Sarah, Johnny's aforementioned former fiancé, are searching through his fan letters and bonding over their shared love of his popped collar and sweater vest collection. And when he eats, he, he talks with his, his, his mouth, mouth full. full. Yeah. I know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> if they'd shown anything of me and Johnny's relationship in this show, the scene would ring less hollow. <laughs> I don't know where my son is right now. Another person you should be familiar with on this show is Reverend Purdy, played by David Ogden Steers, who runs a megachurch and was appointed Johnny's caretaker while he was in a coma. He was a fascinating character in that he fell into that sweet, morally gray area where you were never quite sure what he was capable of. Generally speaking, he had good intentions, but he was willing to do some pretty unscrupulous things in the name of the church. A big part of his character motivations are keeping the church's image clean, not only because of his own beliefs and stake in it as a business, but also because his church is currently partnered with a political candidate whose platform is based on good values and religion in particular. This isn't a small part of the show, it's like the overarching story of the entire series. Additionally, the church handles a lot of Johnny's affairs as well, because Purdy likes to tout his abilities as miracles. Please remember all of this going forward with this episode, because that is about to go out the window like a pile of hot garbage. Somehow, the women have tracked down the Faith Heritage IP address and breached their firewall, allowing them to hack into their video stream, whatever any of that means. Somehow, they tracked down their IP address, breached the firewall, shot their video stream down our T3 line. Then, Maddie sends them something on the computer, either a video or an email, we're not quite sure, but either way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. A flash cartoon of a letter opening and an animated avatar of our hip editor. It's like a YouTube rant meant an e-surance commercial. It's only reasonable, and we are reasonable people, Reverend. She says if they air their trailer on the Faith Heritage Network, they will give them 5% of the profits made from their film, and I guess let Johnny live. All of this is absurd, of course, because Purdy is horrified to even play with the idea that they would air this footage on their channel. That is, until his assistant, a twinkle in his eye, has this counterpoint. They sent over the gross receipts for a movie called The Blair Witch Project. Blair Witch? 5% would be in the neighborhood of 17 million. Perhaps Purdy was being too hasty. How can they make this kidnapping work for them? Hey kids, you ever heard of a little movie called The Blair Witch Project? Now, you might notice some problems with all this so far, but I'm gonna dig a little further into this mess and assure you that it's much, much dumber than you think. They do, in fact, air this video, contextless, on their channel. No explanation, not even a heads up that it's a trailer for a movie, just... Hey, this is kinda messed up, enjoy! 
Just from a marketing standpoint, I don't think people tuning in for Journey to Bethlehem are their demographic. Also, like, <laughs> what distributor is going to be told, oh yeah, we're some no-names making the next Blair Witch Project, it's premiering on this megachurch channel, and they'd be like, yeah, sounds legit. And why does the abandoned murder house have cable? How is the 17 million, or whatever the church thinks it's going to bring in, make up for the damage airing a kidnapping video would do to their reputation? And that's assuming they make any money at all, which wouldn't happen in a fucking million years. They don't know if they can sell this. Let's pretend Johnny signed over the rights for them to use his kidnapping in a movie. Do they even know if this is a good movie at all? The only footage they have that is usable right now is them throwing him in a car trunk. And would you trust this woman's editing skills? Her Flash cartoon has the text cut off. Kidnapping or no, the quality of this film would be shoddy at best. Oliver Stone is a pussy. Kid you not, there are no consequences or follow-ups to Purdy's actions here. We never see him again in this episode. Like, no one ever brings up the fact his church aired a kidnapping video. No one had a problem. I'd love to see the scene where Johnny and Purdy meet up after this, by the way. Like, what was that conversation like? Hey, what the fuck, dude? You were gonna sell my kidnapping video? Hear me out, Johnny. Have you ever heard of a little movie called The Blair Witch Project? Presumably, there was also a comical moment where Bruce explains to Johnny what The Blair Witch Project is, as he was in a coma at the time. Anyway, I guess there's also a serial killer haunted house plot happening? Johnny, I want to have your baby. Okay, just so we're clear, they decided to take the comical angle on the rape vision, did they? Oh my god. They storyboarded their kidnapping? What we're doing is real. Finally, Johnny hits on the truth. The real killer was Nicholas, who's returned to his home to kill them. It turns out he was hiding in plain sight all along, because Nicholas is Anita. You didn't kill them. You couldn't have. It wasn't you. Mm. Pretty spooky, huh, folks? Okay, but why did the house have a hidden murder hole behind the mirror? That's not recent. Did Nicholas make that himself, or was that some sort of hidden pie compartment? You two get in the den. Right now. Get in there and lock the door. Don't come out until I come back. Well, can't believe that worked. Well, see you. Johnny proceeds to go into a whole rambly story about how Nicholas couldn't get over wanting to be a woman, so he killed his whole family. Pretty good story, guys. Uh. It's over, Nicholas. This whole episode is over, but at what cost? Yeah, yeah, just bring one of his captors over so she can have a last word. That's some good police work. Write me. What in the world do you think she sees in him? You got me. What the fuck? What did he do? You don't need to be psychic to see that this episode has its problems. There's definitely some questionable story aspects, and nothing really holds up if you take a couple seconds to think about it. The Dead Zone definitely had better showings than this, but I did enjoy watching this time capsule of bad early 2000s TV. They may not have made the next Blair Witch Project, but they did come up with 45 minutes of entertainment. And I'll catch you all on the tube.